Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm Teresa McWayne, immediate past president of the Columbus Metropolitan Club, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's forum. If you haven't had a chance to turn off those cell phones, we'll ask you to do that now. But keep in mind that we encourage you to tweet. Our hashtag, in case you don't know it, is pound CMC forum. You can follow CMC at CBUS Metro Club. While you're finishing your lunch, I'll tell you about a few upcoming events. And of course, next week, we're taking a break for the Thanksgiving holiday. So our next forum will be November 30th, titled Benchmarking Columbus. Our panelists include Alex Fisher, President and CEO of the Columbus Partnership, Michael Wilkes, Senior Officer of Community Research and Grants Management at the Columbus Foundation, Teresa Long, Columbus Health Commissioner, and Bobby Garber, Executive Director of Community Research Partners. Also, please make your reservations for uh, the club's annual holiday party and not so silent auction, the Jingle Mingle. That'll be held December 15th at the Columbus Metropolitan, I'm sorry, at the Columbus Museum of Art from 5.30 to 8.30. Uh, members can attend for just $35 and bring three guests. You'll want to make sure that you make reservations uh, for these events before you leave for the Thanksgiving holiday. You can find more information about our upcoming forums on our website, columbusmetroclub.org, and in the program. And please take the program with you today and share it with friends and also use it as a reminder for yourself. It's always a treat to introduce new members. We want to welcome Dr. David Decker, president of Franklin University. So Dr. Decker, please stand so we can welcome you. If you're a guest today, I'd invite you to consider membership with Columbus Metropolitan Club and we make it easy to join. There's a membership application at the uh, registration table outside. You can go online or you can see one of the staff members and they will help you get it set up. And when you join, the first forum is on us. Please take a look at the back of your program. It lists many sponsors and these companies sponsor programs throughout the year. They are responsible for providing nearly 50% of CMC's annual budget. If there's anyone that you'd like to see on the list, please talk to one of the CMC staff members. They'd be happy to uh, uh, talk to those individuals or companies. We, I doubt that there's anyone in this room who isn't aware of the Columbus Foundation's The Big Give. And we are thrilled that the Columbus Metropolitan Club raised an estimated $9,598.68 and will receive another $1,245.89 in matching dollars. totaling $11,129.85 from the big give. Thank you to all of the individuals who participated and made donations. And again, we thank the Columbus Foundation for its leadership in creating this fundraising initiative. And, of course, for their sponsorship of today's program. The foundation not only supports CMC, but hundreds of organizations across the community. Please join me in thanking the Columbus Foundation for the sponsorship of our series this month on, on all of our Columbus forums. 
Let's welcome the foundation's president and CEO, Doug Kreidler, to the stage to introduce our program. Well, thank you, Teresa. The Columbus Foundation is uh, very happy to sponsor this chair-moving uh, event today. Um, for those of you who haven't gotten any act yet, you just sort of squiggle back and forth, and when the cacophony uh, reduces, we'll start. I think it's interesting, Rich, she, uh, there was, I don't think, I might have missed the mention, but uh, Rich Terrapack is not with us today. You know, Rich uh, works hard on, on, and he looks young. You know, you know, he has a very youthful appearance. Well, he took that to sort of an absurd degree last week, where he um, left here, went to his office, and, found, and discovered that he had appendicitis and had to have his appendix removed. Now, you know, typically, that's a young person. It's maybe an eighth grader's kind of an event, so he is even internalizing his youth, and I guess we have to, to celebrate that. So first, I just want to, uh, I was invited to take a minute to take stock of the remarkable and generous response of our community to the Big Give, an historic day of giving for Columbus. For 24 hours, this was philanthropic lightning in a bottle, a thrilling example of excitement that can come from working together to help others and providing a great technological tool to do so. By intent, this was driven primarily by social media and definitely generated what the gurus in that space call a rising audience. Connecting with the audiences of your audience. Connecting with 110,000 Facebook post views. And a hashtag for the big give reached more than 130,000 people via almost 800 tweets. So we could not be more proud to have provided this opportunity to our community. And when I say we, I mean the entire staff and governing committee at the Columbus Foundation. We know that it was the nonprofits and the donors that fueled this success. But I just want to take this opportunity to thank the staff for putting so much work into what was for us, not just a giving opportunity for the community, but two important complex dimensions of software. And in some ways, we've sort of become a software development uh, company over these last few years as we continue to innovate and create opportunities for easy on-ramps to access for, for the latest in tools and philanthropy. But I want to make specific mention because these are the kinds of things that don't, don't uh, uh, generate uh, uh, you know, newspaper coverage or whatever in the thanks of specific people. But Joyce Ray, Brenda Watts, Carrie Daly, Angela Parsons, Stacy Morris, and Emily Saver, some of whom are with us today, Everybody who's with us today at the Columbus Foundation table made a difference, but in particular, the incredible amount of testing and so forth that they went through, and the marketing, Carol Harmon, Nick George, and others. So I want to, in the end, just mention that over $7.7 .7 million was contributed. I think you know that number. You may not know that over 17,000 unique visitors uh, came to the site engaging in over 13,000 transactions, and it was folks like you and others in over 600 cities that, that uh, made up that incredible uh, success. And then there's the million dollars we were able to raise to expand the giving done by you, and at the last minute we were even able to find a way to cover the credit card expenses so that 100% of each uh, gift was given uh, will be received by the uh, nonprofits. And as I, I, I mentioned over the weekend, it was Last week was a tumultuous week in a lot of uh, ways in, in uh, America, and we couldn't help but take stock that in the same week where some of the worst of humanity was on display, that it was a tremendous honor for us to be a part of making some of the best of humanity be heard, be seen, and be received by those in need. So thank you for rallying for all the nonprofits who serve our community so well. Speaking about some of the best of humanity, we have a great panel for you today on a topic of immense importance to the future prosperity of our region. The topic today is strengthening Central Ohio's economy, the college degree imperative. Statistics show that salaries for young adults with college degrees are significantly higher than those without such diplomas. Is higher education attainable for everyone? 
What are the barriers <clears throat> to prospective students to achieve success at, in an institution of higher education? How does an educated workforce support Central Ohio's businesses and organizations and overall uh, economy? Our panel at this afternoon will address these questions. Our first panelist is Gordon Brawlier. Since July 2010, he has been the president of the Ohio Foundation for Independent Colleges, which is a partnership between Ohio's independent institutions of higher learning and leaders of business and industry. He's a 1973 alumnus of Mountain Union College, where he served in many positions in the Development Alumni Admissions Department from 1975 to 1988. Prior to joining OFIC, he was Vice President for Development for Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington. Please welcome Gordon Brawlier. The Honorable Joyce Beatty is, a, is Senior Vice President in the Office of Outreach and Engagement at The Ohio State University. Before coming to Ohio State, Joyce served in the Ohio House of Representatives. Her business background includes 20 years of small business management and training through Joyce Beatty & Associates, Inc. The Dayton native holds a bachelor's degree in speech from Central State University, a master's in counseling psychology from Wright State, doctoral coursework and exams completed at the University of Cincinnati, and honorary PhD degrees from Ohio Dominican University Central State, and Central State University awarded to her as she delivered their commencement addresses. Joyce is married to Otto Beatty, Jr., a Columbus attorney, businessman, and former state representative. Please welcome Joyce Beatty. Our next panelist is David Harrison, who was named the fifth president of Columbus State Community College in July 2010. Prior to his appointment, he was vice provost of regional campuses for the University of Central Florida. Dr. Harrison held leadership positions with Seminole Community College in Sanford, Florida, and Sinclair Community College in Dayton, Ohio. He earned his PhD at, it says, at Ohio Uni State University. I, I think it's at the Ohio State, is that? Right, right, it's a typo, he says, yes. So he earned his PhD at the Ohio State University, an MBA with the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Joseph M. Katz Graduate School of Business, and Bachelor's in Chemical Engineering at the University of Dayton. Please welcome David Harrison. <laughs> As you might guess, I am particularly pleased to introduce Lisa Cordes, Executive Vice President of Community Research and Grants Management at the Columbus Foundation and leader of the software development project that made the technology of the big give and power philanthropy possible. Yay, Lisa. Prior to joining the foundation, Dr. Cordes held leadership positions at the Columbus School for Girls, the Childhood League Center, Center for New Directions, Clinic for Child Study and Family Therapy in Akron, Ohio, and the Washington Center for Academic Internships in Washington, D.C. Dr. Cordes received, I, I, at the office I call her Lisa, but you know, we got every, Dr. Cordes re received her Bachelor of Arts from Syracuse University, her Master of Arts from West Virginia University and her PhD from the University of Akron. Please welcome my esteemed colleague, Lisa Cordes. Lisa, it's all yours. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. It's a privilege for us to be in a room with people that care about education and particularly higher education. A recent analysis by, George, by Georgetown University's Center on Education and the Workforce found that more than 60% of all U.S. jobs will require a post-secondary education by 2018. The percentage of adults aged 25 to 64 in Ohio and Franklin County with two to four-year degrees is below 35%. This is a big gap and puts our region at a serious competitive disadvantage. According to CEOs for Cities, 58% of a city's success as measured by per capita income can be attributed to the percentage of the adult population with a college degree. Some economists suggest that this is a conservative number. Bottom line, there is a direct correlation between education levels and income and the strength of our economy. College graduates earn 74% more than high school graduates do today, a gap that is up from 40% from 1980. A current four-year college degree attainment rate in the United States is 
to increase this one percentage point to 29 percent would be associated with an increase in aggregate personal income of 124 billion per year. This is what CEOs for Cities calls the talent dividend. The Columbus Foundation, in partnership with local colleges and universities and community leaders, has entered the Central Ohio region in the CEO for Cities talent, Di talent dividend prize competition. The prize will be awarded to the metropolitan area that exhibits the greatest increase in the number of post-secondary degrees granted over a three-year period. The winning community will receive $1 million, a $1 million grant sponsored by the Kresge and Lumina Foundations. The prize will be used by the winning city to launch a national promotion campaign centered on feature, featuring its talent and its talent development. 56 communities are in the competition, including five cities in Ohio. Actually, Ohio has the most cities from one state in the competition. The other cities are Youngstown, Cleveland, Akron, and Toledo. The competition is designed as an effort to increase college attainment in our nation's cities by one percentage point, and the winner will be announced in September 2014. Increasing our pipeline of a better educated workforce aligns with our community's economic goals. Columbus 2020's goal to add 150,000 new jobs and to e increase per capita income by 30% by 2020. The Columbus metro region's per capita income right now is a little over $27,000. The U.S. per capita income is a little over $26,000. A 30% increase by 2020 for Columbus would bump up our per capita income to over $35,000. According to the Lumina Foundation, a modest 1% one increase, 1 increase in the number of local college graduates for Columbus would mean $1.3 billion in our economy per year. So how well educated is Ohio? According to the 2010 American Community Survey data, 24.6% 24, of Ohio residents have a four-year degree. That is 4% below the national average of 28.2. Ohio is below the national average. Let's take a look at our region that includes Franklin and surrounding counties, if you can see this PowerPoint, which you may not be able to. I'll tell you about it since it's hard to see. Uh, so the, the percentage of Franklin County residents with a with a college degree is 35.1%. The percentage with an associate's degree is 6.6%. The percentage that have some college is 21%. Just think of that, we could get that 21% to move closer to degree attainment. And 37% of Franklin County does not have a degree. Surrounding counties have, a far, have far less of an educated population. Morrow, 13%, Pickaway, 13%, Madison, 15%, Union, 29%, Licking, 21%, Fairfield, 25%. But get this, how many people live in Delaware? All right, I bet you all have college degrees. Because 48.9% of people that live in Delaware have a college degree. That's one and two. So check this out. They're on the bottom. Uh, Washington, D.C. has the best educated metropolitan area in the country at 46.1%. That's more than double the, the area that has the lowest, which is Las Vegas, at 20%. But Washington, D.C. and Delaware are competing for having the highest number of people with college degrees. Columbus is well positioned in many ways to increase its degree attainment rate. There are great schools and promising growth sectors. We need to foster a great, greater attainment. We need to foster, we need to focus on greatest, greater attainment to build the local labor pool and beat other states for the jobs for the future and perhaps win the $1 million. Our panelists respectively represent independent four-year colleges, a research university, and a community college. Each can lend important insight into the challenges and opportunities for degree attainment. So I will launch the panel discussion by asking each of our panelists to describe the degree attainment rates for their respective institutions and tell us about the barriers to degree attainment rates faced by their students. David, would you like to start? You say that as if I have a choice. <laughs> um, thanks, Lisa. 
we, uh, a, a lot of our students at community college don't come to us uh, to earn degrees. And, uh, and one of the things we're really working on is for those who do, uh, making that pathway um, more seamless. Uh, in terms of the barriers, uh, there's a lot of research in higher ed that uh, list what they would consider risk factors, at risk factors for, for students earning degrees. And, and that includes whether or not a student uh, is a first generation college student, first in their family to attend college, uh, whether or not the student is working 20 or more hours, uh, whether or not the student is financially independent, in other words, not living with mom and dad, having them pay for, for their expenses, uh, and whether or not there are gaps uh, in, uh, in a student's education. In, in other words, uh, have they sat out uh, half a year or a year uh, between different educational uh, institutions? That describes most of our students uh, at Columbus State. Our students are busy. Uh, many of them, even our younger students, are working uh, one or more jobs. Uh, a lot of them have uh, family responsibilities, and whereas higher education is a priority for them because of life circumstance, in many cases, it can't be their number one priority. Uh, so we're really working to, uh, to address those students' needs and, and, as we say, meet students where they are um, in that regard. Another issue that we're really working with is, uh, is college readiness. Uh, a lot of students come to Columbus State not ready to do college level work and, and that's both our, our younger students who are coming directly from high school uh, as well as those who have been out of school for a while. Many of our students decide relatively late that they want to go to college. Again, even those who are coming directly from high school may not decide till late in their junior or their senior year that they want to come to college. So the coursework they've taken at the high school level uh, may not prepare them uh, for college level work. Our older students, uh, again, many of them haven't taken a math class for 15 years, so uh, being prepared to do college level math is something that takes, takes a little while. So those are some of the barriers uh, that we work with every day. Thanks, David. When you look at Ohio State, we're a little different. As Lisa mentioned, as a research university, one of the largest and most complex uh, universities in America. So when you look at Ohio State and students coming there, they're looking at coming to an environment where there are some total 64,000 students, 175 majors, and somebody probably knows someone who graduated from the Ohio State University because we have 465,000 alumni. When you talk about college readiness uh, for us, we're very proud because we see ourselves as part of that economic engine. When you look this year alone at the number of freshmen who entered our university, 30,000 applications, and we were able to take a little less than 7,000 students in, and I'm comfortable saying this because I have two people in the audience that will correct me. We have our Vice President of Student Life, Dr. Jake here, and we also uh, have the person that Gordon looks to in our meetings to make sure I get these numbers right, and, and that's uh, Dolan Ivanovich. And what Dolan said to me is important to know on college readiness. This year, when you're looking at test scores, we have some of the highest ACT and SAT scores when you're looking at a 20 28.1 score for freshmen coming in. So for us coming to the university, sometimes it's, it's a little different than in the two-year school, but because we have several front doors, we have regional universities, and that allows us to also be the university that can partner because our students come and they can get a traditional experience, they can get a non-traditional experience, they can be partnered with major companies and corporations through student learning and through service learning, and also we're very global. We just had the opportunity to have students to come back from as far as West Africa and Ghana, Brazil and China, and, and those are freshmen oftentimes, and it is the norm for us to be able to say with 14 colleges and some 175 majors, we can meet the needs of anyone wanting to come to The Ohio State University. Let me answer your question, uh, Lisa. We have 34 uh, members of the Ohio Foundation of Independent Colleges, 34 non-tax funded institutions across the state of Ohio. 
uh, most of whom had their beginnings in the middle of the 1800s as the wilderness of Ohio was opening up. Most began with a religious tradition. Most have maintained that in some form or fashion today. Uh, the question you asked is, is, what are the barriers to attainment for a college degree and what are our graduation rates? Uh, with 34 very different, and the operative word with two of my presidents, at least in the room that I could see earlier, is independent. Um, we have a range, a graduation range of from 12% to 88%, okay? Uh, we have some institutions that are more focused on adult learners, so that percentage would expectedly be much lower. Uh, we have some that are traditional national liberal arts and sciences institutions uh, that, that set the bar pretty high. Uh, part of, of what we uh, hopefully provide to that talent dividend uh, is a, a rather exceptional student body. Uh, we are, as a, as a group, probably not capable of handling uh, as much of the preparation for underprepared students as uh, community colleges might be in others. Uh, but we have become access institutions at the same time. Uh, if you go back to the days when I was in school, um, about anyone who graduated from an Ohio high school could go to Ohio State University, regardless of your academic background. That's certainly not the case today. Um, in my time, you flunked out if you left college. Today, students leave because they run out of money they hit an academic hurdle, or a financial hurdle they just can't get over. And, and we're going to hear a little bit later from uh, one of those students. Uh, but that's our challenge. Uh, we are access institutions increasingly for low to moderate income students who choose a pathway to higher education. Um, I'll stop there because we're short on time. Every institution of higher education would like to improve its graduation rates. So can you tell us about what those goals are for you and those strategies that you're using to increase the graduation rate? My first. Columbus and Central Ohio, I think, is extremely well positioned um, to, to take a leadership role nationally. And I, I really want to commend the Columbus Foundation and other community leaders for for taking this on. The, the, the talent dividend um, uh, process is, is a good excuse uh, for us to get together and really combine strategies. But uh, as you look at Columbus as being one of, the, one of the largest college towns in America, Columbus State plays a unique portfolio in that, uh, or a unique role in that portfolio of institutions. It's, it's the only open access public community college in that space. Uh, we're becoming the front door uh, to a bachelor's degree uh, for more and more students uh, in our area. Uh, so a big part of our strategy for degree completion are deep partnerships with our college and university colleagues. Uh, Joyce mentioned the, uh, the selectivity of Ohio State's freshman class. Let me just say that that's good for our region. Uh, it is in all of our best interest that Ohio State become the most prominent research institution in the world. Uh, and recruiting the highest potential freshman class from around the world, bringing those students to Central Ohio is a good thing. And through our partnership with Ohio State that we call Preferred Pathway, uh, local students have a guaranteed, have guaranteed admission to Ohio State upon earning a degree uh, from Columbus State. So our advisors are working shoulder to shoulder for students who come to Columbus State knowing that they want to pursue a bachelor's degree at Ohio State so that immediately on coming to Columbus State, they've got a four-year plan towards a bachelor's degree. We have partnerships with many of our private and independent colleges as well. Uh, we have uh, what has become a real home run in a three plus one uh, degree completion program with Franklin University and a similar program with Ohio University which is nominally targeted at adult students where they're taking fully 75 percent of their credits towards a bachelor's degree at Columbus State and transferring seamlessly to Franklin. We've got deeper and emerging partnerships with Ohio Dominican University, with Capital, with Ohio Wesleyan University, Mount Carmel School of Nursing. Again, really trying to make sure that we're not just a group of colleges, but we've got a connected network that ensures access for many students from many walks of life. At the same time, we're reaching uh, into our high schools uh, to partner more deeply to address the college readiness issue that I talked about earlier. Uh, so that students aren't coming to Columbus State upon graduating from high school 
and, and, and are surprised that they're not ready to take college level work. Uh, so we're working with high schools to assess them earlier in their high school career. And then our faculty are working with high school teachers to ensure that alignment of curriculum in the junior and senior year better mirrors uh, the college experience. And we're trying to get to the point where more and more high school graduates are graduating with some college credit to get them on their way to a degree. Do you have a percentage goal you'd like to share with us? Well, we, can I get back to you on that? <laughs> we, 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 fully, we fully expect to double our completion rate. What I'm not ready to give you is the time frame for that. So maybe, That's a great goal. Maybe that can be another CMC discussion in a few months. And if you doubled that, how many would that be? It, it would. <laughs> I, I, we think we can become one of the top degree producing community colleges in America in a short period of time. That's awesome. <laughs> We're behind you. Lisa, let me put some things in perspective. Gordon talked about uh, what I'm going to make reference to is the old, the Ohio State University. But if we look at a 10-year history and pattern as we talk about talent dividend and you talk about uh, the trend lines, if we would go back just 10 years and we talked about graduation rates, we were at about 40%. If we fast forward to where we are today in um, 2011, we're proud to say on a four, for four years, we're at 59%. If you go to six years, we're uh, at 80% with graduation rates. Earlier, you talked about uh, retention. And, and let me just tell you, when you talk about looking at the Ohio State now and going from first year to second year, we have a 93% retention that's rate. So, so that says we're doing something right, something right with our two-year colleges, something right with our corporate community, something right with our private and public schools, with our local high schools. We had the Metro School right there on our campus. And when you look at in the first year with the Metro School, every student, diverse students, students that would come to your universities or some of your colleges, every one of those students graduated with honors. Every one of those students got accepted into a university to go to college. So when you look at what could we do better, uh, we anticipate that you would ask us about a goal, so I'll help David out and tell you we have a goal for 2015, and, and that goal is 60% uh, that we'd like to be uh, close to that when we uh, look at our retention rates. We would also uh, say that as we build partnerships with our students, we start at home at the university. So we have put several things in place to increase and to meet those goals because we certainly know when you talk about retention, first year to second year, or you talk about graduation rates, for all of us, I would say that economy plays a part academics plays a part, and if there is a third thing, it is connecting the students to make them comfortable in that environment. So as we look at how do we put things in places for those challenges, we are looking at doing a number of things through student life and through enrollment by making sure that students understand how to get connected with faculty, making sure that we bring on enough faculty so you don't get that student in his or her second or third or fourth year and finding out they can't get into a class and they need that class to graduate. We're also giving them real life opportunities. When, when I was in college, it was all about the classroom. And we are very clear at Ohio State that it is more than the eight to five classroom. It's getting them integrated with folks like you in the audience. It's letting them have those real life experiences uh, so they can function and succeed in this very non-traditional world that we live in today. 
with a range of institutions. I, I can't give you a specific goal, but I can say that all of our colleges take this very seriously and are obviously interested in increasing the degree attainment levels. But let's talk about some of the strategies that we're involved with that are behind that process. Um, first of all, like, like you've, you've heard uh, from David here, articulation agreements with community colleges are taking place across the state and are engaging opportunities for the non-tax funded sector, if you will, to participate and to flow students more comfortably onto their campuses. Uh, that initiative will start to really show outcomes within the next few years, but it is a statewide uh, positive issue that we've seen. Uh, we have uh, just finished last week uh, at Bob Evans a diversity forum where we bring together corporate and collegiate diversity managers in the state to discuss common issues. And uh, thanks to funding from AT&T, Chase, uh, Dominion, and the Timken Foundation, we're creating best practices that are increasing the uh, retention and graduation rate of minority students at a significantly higher factor. Uh, there's also a program in place. We're, we're the largest scholarship management agency in the state of Ohio. And as such, we have a chance to work with corporations and some foundations uh, in creating engaging ideas that ultimately impact the lives of young people. I'll just speak to two very quickly. Uh, Graduate Now is a partnership that was established uh, this fall with the Columbus Foundation. And uh, we also have in place uh, with the Huntington, uh, Huntington Fellows Program to help uh, minority students who match up with the Huntington's human resource interest to find a pathway through college, uh, a job, uh, and a career. Uh, and and this, is, these, this model is happening in a variety of forms across the state, but it does ultimately impact the degree attainment level that, that we're looking for. I have a quick question because we also need to meet our student. Um, our, so neither Steve Jobs or Bill Gates has a college degree. And there's a book academically adrift that says it's not the college degree, it's your cognitive thinking and your critical thinking skills. And there are many college graduates right now who can't find jobs. So when you think about the future and our economy, how viable is the traditional um, academic higher, educa higher education model that you are all so well serving? It's more important than it's ever been. Um, both Doug and Lisa uh, have mentioned uh, some statistics. Um, people with college degrees over, over a lifetime, over a career, uh, have always uh, out-earned significantly uh, people with only a high school diploma. Um, that gap has gotten larger uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, if you look at uh, unemployment rates now, the unemployment rate for college graduates is less than half that from the, of those with only, only a high school diploma. Uh, and even if you look at, at, at recent college grads, um, their unemployment rate right now is about 9%. The unemployment rate for recent high school grads uh, is 35%. This isn't the first time in our history um, where recent college grads have had to attend bar or wait tables for a little while or while their dream job came along. Um, this, uh, this, uh, the, the, the need for a college education uh, is more important now than it's ever been. The, 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 the title of this panel uh, is focused on economic prosperity. Take a look at what's going on in China and in India. Uh, how, they're investing huge sums of money uh, in higher education uh, for, their, for their children and for their adults. Uh, India is, has got a massive public infrastructure project focusing on developing a community college network uh, nationally. Um, if that's our competitors, if those are our competitors globally, now is not the time for us to take the foot off the gas pedal. Let me just uh, agree with Doug for the sake of time, but I think it's important for uh, us to uh, share that it is not only important for us based on the statistics, and I think you quoted the Georgetown University's uh, research that they did and was entitled, What's It Worth? The Economic Value of College Majors. In addition to the 74% that you gave us, Lisa, it tells us that for 
at the higher level, it increases. So if you have a master's degree, it goes up to 84%. But I think we really have to look to the future. I think you have to look at where we are now when you look at minority students, African Americans and Hispanics. I think when you look at women and you look at fast forwarding from those who are just entering school uh, and as Gordon would say, it's K through life, not just K through 12 or K through 20. We're going to be looking at a different population of folks. And I think it is very important. And some folks are getting it right now. Because when you look at universities, and, and more uh, specifically to Ohio State, when you look at the first year retention and graduation rates for African Americans and Hispanics, we exceed the national average. When you look at public universities and some of our private institutions, we're seeing that we're getting more minority students in college, and it is important for us to make sure that they get through the process because that's our workforce. We are including students in more things so they are in the room with folks like us. We have a student trustee here with us today, and she is part of our future, and when you hear her articulate her plan, that alone will convince you that they are our future. We have our superintendent of schools in the audience, and she reminds us every day that we have to look at these numbers to make sure, as she would call them, our babies, our children graduate and go on to school and graduate. But I do think it's important to say it is also not only the cognitive learning, but it is the skill set. It's getting out of the norm and making sure that they have all of the skills to do the traditional and the non-traditional. I, I would agree. I, I think we're all saying basically the same thing. It's amazing that there's a controversy about the value of higher education, at, particularly at this time. But let's, let me look at just some quick statistics I'll share with you. It relates to what Lisa had mentioned earlier. Again, Ohio ranks has a 24% ranking of all of our population holding a baccalaureate degree. Uh, national average is 28 percent. Mm -hmm. The state with the highest is Massachusetts with 38 percent. Now, let's, let's look at, at what the, the return on that investment is. Ohio's unemployment rate is 9 percent. Massachusetts is at 7 percent. Ohio's per capita income, $25,000. In Massachusetts, $33,000. The United States average, $27,000 they almost exactly mimic the percentage of degree attainment levels in terms of return on investment for per capita income. One strategy that we have um, initiated is in partnership with the Columbus Partnership and the Kresge Foundation. The Columbus Foundation has helped to build a scholarship fund and I'll let Gordon describe that briefly and introduce our student and then we can move to questions. Graduate Now uh, evolved out of some conversations that Lisa and I had starting uh, last spring. Uh, it is a fund designed to help students, particularly in their senior year, who reach a financial wall. Something significant happens in their lives and they will not graduate without intervention of some scholarship assistance. We created this uh, fund to support students uh, from Franklin County attending our 34 institutions and also for those students at Ohio State, at uh, Columbus State, and uh, at CCAD. Uh, the first recipient of that scholarship is with us today and I would like to introduce Ben Elliser who is a senior from Gahanna at Otterbein majoring in environmental science and minoring in earth science. Ben would you please come up. Hello, my name is Ben Elsesser, and I'd like to start by thanking the Columbus Foundation and the Ohio Foundation of Independent Colleges for selecting me to receive the Graduate Now Scholarship. It is truly an honor to be here and being the first recipient of this award. I'm originally from Gahanna, Ohio, and I'm currently a senior at Otterbein University majoring in environmental science. I'm also a student athlete 
and three-year letter winner. I currently hold down two jobs, as well as interning for the City of Columbus Water Quality Assurance Lab. I chose Otterbein because it has a close-knit community and has given me every opportunity I could ask for and more. After graduation, I hope to find a job as an environmental professional. Going into my senior year, my family and I hit numerous financial roadblocks that were going to jeopardize my ability to complete my degree. My mother was in and out of the hospital, which left us with unexpected medical bills. And as with most seniors, I found myself without as much financial aid as I had received in previous years at Otterbein. My parents worked so hard to provide for me, my brother, and sister. And even though we exha had exhausted every possible avenue for additional financial aid, we were still coming up short. Having no other choice, I was making plans to leave Otterbein at the end of the semester, uncertain on if or when I would complete my degree, just months away from graduation. The creation of the Graduate Now Scholarship has changed all that for me. Because of this scholarship, I will not be leaving Otterbein or my aspirations of becoming a college graduate. This gift has completely changed the course of my life and has ensured that I will graduate this year. I cannot thank the Columbus Foundation and the Ohio Foundation of Independent Colleges enough for selecting me for the scholarship. This means so much to me and my family, and your generosity has allowed, to, allowed me to fulfill my dreams of becoming a college graduate it, and becoming an environmental professional. Your gift will not be wasted and is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Let's open it up for questions uh, for our panelists. Here comes Kathleen, here comes Jane. They're racing. Thank you. Um, I'm Jane Scott. Uh, I absolutely cannot um, forego the opportunity to brag about the Columbus Metropolitan Club's partnership with Ohio State in our civic engagement class. We are extremely proud of that, and I'll throw the gauntlet out to all the other college presidents and faculty and, and folks that are here. Uh, a number of years ago, we were able to, uh, thanks to uh, Mindy Wright and Herb Asher and uh, Julie Graber, we began a program with Ohio State to um, have a college credit course to provide the curriculum for the students to come to the Metropolitan Club as their curriculum. We have 60 students that have completed it and the uh, John Glenn School has just adopted this course now and is gonna put quite a bit of energy behind the leadership. My question to you is, um, we've heard some amazing stories from the students after they've completed this experience and the Metropolitan Club has pretty much footed the bill for them to come to lunch and we're happy to do so. We'd like to reach out to other colleges to start programs like this as well. My question to you, you've mentioned um, the importance of outreach programs with students. Um, give me a sense of what this means to the kids as far as being able to um, have relationships and experiences with the community and with professional adults. Does it encourage them to graduate? Does it give them energy? Does it give them jobs? Let me know your take on that and, and whether this is important for us to continue this program. Well, obviously from The Ohio State University, the answer would be yes. <laughs> And as Senior Vice President of Outreach and Engagement, the answer would be yes. But, but on a very serious note, um, we want to commend you, and, and certainly it, it sounds a, a little biased because it's our university that stepped out with it, but we want to also expand it in, in doing other things beyond this because it is important. Think about yourself and, and think about your success and I am comfortable saying with most, if not all successes, there's partnerships, there's relationships. And so what you're doing by allowing our students and others to come here, and the gentleman that was just here, Someone's gonna go over and talk to him. Someone's gonna start asking him about next steps. Someone's gonna say, come talk to me because now he's gonna need a job. And that comes from being in an environment of people who understand 
the value of outreach and engagement. When you look at most of our large grants now, when we're putting pilot projects out there, they ask you to describe what your outreach and engagement is. So I think it is very important for us to include our students outside of that classroom. Next question. I'm going to piggyback on Jane's comment. Um, I was I completed your class, and my name is Jordan Davis, and hi, Dr. J. Um, I always thought that one of the key ingredients to success in college is an engagement piece. And engagement can either come on the campus level or in the community level. I think Ohio State and many of our schools do a great job at the campus level because it's right at home. It's easy for most, um, and you can constantly work on that, where I think we can do a lot more in terms of community. Um, currently, I work with the Columbus Partnership, and we talk all the time about engaging our young students and keeping them connected to Columbus, because when we have these jobs coming up where we need 60% college graduates, we're going to need the graduates from Ohio State and all of our area colleges to stay um, in Columbus. So what can we be doing more? Um, within our college setting to make sure students are exposed to the Columbus area and finding opportunities that keep them here for our own economic development. I think one of the things is, is those programs increase in importance, which I agree with, is we've got to make room for non-traditional students with those kinds of experiences. Uh, as I said, many of our students are part-time, many of them are, are working just to pay their bills or buy books or pay tuition. Um, so it's hard for them to leave a, a, a paying gig to go to a volunteer gig. Um, so if there are ways that we can work together uh, to better connect those experiences uh, for students who have a lot of things going on in their lives, I think that uh, that'll be a big benefit. The Columbus Foundation helped to start Easy Columbus. Doug, is it still called Easy Columbus? So look at that website up to engage local college students. Thank you. Kathleen? There's a, a concept in the economy called disruptive innovation. Um, an example of it is when IBM was busy building giant mainframe computers and some very smart young people figured out how to make uh, PCs work and available to everyone with a much lower cost. It completely changed how we approach computing. Um, this is a concept that's being discussed in higher education as well with um, online teaching and the ability to change the way education is delivered. And I'd love to hear from each of you how um, the disruptive innovation of online um, can be used to advantage in each of your organizations while still maintaining the quality um, and the engagement that is so important to a well-rounded education. I guess I'll jump in, in here. We, uh, Columbus State does uh, uh, more online learning than any public uh, college university in Ohio. Uh, and, uh, some 40% of our students at any given quarter are taking, uh, taking at least one online course. And, and again, as I described our student demographics, that's probably predictable um, because it, it allows uh, uh, students to fit education in their lives in a way uh, that, uh, that they might not be able to otherwise. Um, one of the areas that we're really focused on now, though, in addition to pure online, is our blended opportunities, um, which give students um, really the, the advantage of, uh, of using technology but still having access to, um, uh, to, a, to a professor. Uh, and we have a number of faculty um, who are organizing their online classes uh, so that the students do the lectures at home and homework in class. Um, where they have help with the, with the faculty member uh, to work through some of those tough issues and it also allows them to have the interaction with their, with their uh, other students uh, on team-based activities. So that's a direction that we're heading. I would probably say at The Ohio State University, distance learning is very important to us and we have a strong uh, Office of Academic Affairs. And so this is something that we have been more engaged in because when you look at innovation and you look at change, we've been out in the forefront. We've taken that same approach when you look at STEM education, which is very critical. So we have a whole new division of STEM learning and we are, um, probably in the forefront of many of the universities like 
our university as a research uh, university because distance learning, online learning, using technology is, is what we do. So we're very excited uh, about the partnerships and, and the opportunities that we are uh, doing with some of the programs that came out of the Third Frontier. Many of those programs have, were built around technology and online uh, research because it's about innovation. Thank you. Greg Brown is our last person to ask a question. Uh, hi, thanks Lisa and Columbus Foundation for sponsoring this. Um, I'm Greg Brown from the Graham Family Schools, a group of charter schools in Central Ohio. We have three schools, one being the Charles School at Ohio Dominican University, an early college high school. There's 10 in Ohio, three in Franklin County, the Metro School at Ohio State, Afrocentric uh, at Columbus State, and, and our school, the Charles School at Ohio Dominican. We have institutionalized at those three the conversation around and practice around college readiness and college remediation. But presently, it seems to be housed in freshman year at colleges. This is where we're typically remediating. It's a scourge not only financially on the community, but it also is, is one of the main causes for why people drop out of college, because they weren't prepared and it's daunting for anybody. I'm wondering how we can move that conversation in an institutional way to the high school college conversation so that, you know, and this probably involves OD and the Board of Regents, but how do we move that conversation in the practice of college readiness and remediation down to a point where it's manageable so that when students go to college, they're more likely to succeed? We've got, uh, we've got a group of superintendents and, and college presidents and our collective staffs that are working on that, that very issue. We had 150 of us at Columbus State last week uh, developing a regional strategy in that regard. I talked about it a little, little bit in my earlier remarks, but the idea is for, uh, for the colleges, in my case obviously Columbus State, to get behind the firewall um, at the high schools and make sure, as you say, that the, um, uh, the freshman year at college is doing college level work. Um, so the specifics are uh, at the junior year, typically, uh, we would administer some kind of college placement test. That could be the SAT, the ACT, or in our case, we use the COMPASS test so that students and their families know at that point in time whether or not they're college ready. If they're not, there's a track that we're working on, uh, a pilot right now with Reynoldsburg High School, that essentially mirrors what would be the first year of developmental math education at Columbus State, doing that in the senior year at Reynoldsburg High School. And I won't go into the gory details about it, but, uh, but it gives students a lot of flexibility at a mastery level to make sure that they're coming then to uh, Columbus State as college-ready freshmen. For students who do test into a college-ready path, then we're working on a dual enrollment path. So as I said before, more students are earning college credit in high school, which gets them well on their way. We've got a lot of school districts that are interested in this. One of the great things that you all need to be aware of is there's a real collaborative spirit among all educators in this town to address this issue. No one's defensive about it. We're confronting the hard facts, and I think we've got, uh, got a good pathway going forward. Let me just add this. I think it has to start also at an earlier age than the high school children that you're talking about and the college students. So it, it starts early on. One of the things that we're doing at the university, and it is a partnership, so we're trying something that's very non-traditional. We have a partnership with the Ohio Department of Education, and we have a training program that we're operating out of the Fisher uh, Business College with outreach and engagement. And we have principals from all over the state of Ohio who are coming into this training so we can talk about how do you build successes, how do you have to ch change to meet the non-traditional needs to make students more um, ready, ready to graduate. You know, this whole community and state has a goal for 2025 that we're going to have more graduates. So we have to have early on at the pre-age start talking about readiness and graduation and being connected. So we have about 300 principals who are going through a program so we can hopefully train them to work with the teachers, to work with the parents in the community. And this is all schools, charter schools, 
public schools, and so bringing everybody together because at the end of the day, we have to have our children ready to get to high school. We have to have enough students that can take the honors and AP classes so when they get to Columbus State, Ohio State, uh, Franklin University, et cetera, that they are prepared. We engaged uh, about five years ago uh, with some of our faculty in creating a program, uh, the Bridges Program. It's in Northeast Ohio. It's reaching 2,400 inner city kids. Uh, it's very much experiential education. And uh, we're working both with public and private, with parochial schools, uh, with charter schools. And we're just now starting to see the outcomes of this. But it's a way to engage in that conversation, which we believe is going to lead to more students being prepared to advance to higher education, public, private, two year, four year. Uh, there's not one answer. I don't, I don't think there's one answer. I think this is a lot of folks trying to get their arms around a real problem right now. Thank you. Unfortunately, we've come to the close of our program today. We could probably stay here all afternoon and, and be continuously inspired. So we thank our panel. As we close, I invite you to continue the conversation, though, over coffee and cookies in our lobby. And before you leave today, please remember to sign up for the next forum on Wednesday, November 30th, benchmarking Columbus, and December 15th for our CMC mingle, Jingle Mingle. Please help me thank the Columbus Foundation for sponsoring the November series on Columbus. And let's thank our panel, Gordon Breuer, Joyce Beatty, and David Harrison. And our moderator, Lisa Cordes. Thank you for being here and enjoy the afternoon. Happy Thanksgiving.